welcome to another episode of Healthy Talks. I'm your host for this episode, Joshua, and today I'm joined by Paul Jeb, the Associate Chief Nurse, Patient Experience, Engagement and Safeguarding at Lancashire and South Cumbria NHS Foundation Trust. Welcome. How are you today, Paul? Hi, Joshua. I'm great. Thank you. It's a beautiful day in the northwest of England. Oh, that's wonderful. To what degree is it a beautiful day? I know the weather is sometimes very unpredictable there. Uh, we can see blue cloud, blue sky uh, with a few clouds, but there's no rain and uh, the wind has uh, dropped, so it's not as cold as it was, which is always good. Fantastic, fantastic. That does sound like a beautiful day. We are having very cold weather here, very overcast in Cape Town, South Africa. So, but we're heading into our deepest winters at the stage. Mm. So I'm sure you know all about those types of weather patterns. Yeah, yeah. Your your deep winters are summer. So yes, correct. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining the podcast. So let's start. Can you maybe start by sharing about what inspired you to pursue a career in healthcare, especially in nursing? Uh, Yeah, so um, I I thought about career in healthcare for a while when I was at school. But when I was um, probably about 14, my my father was involved in a road traffic accident and had to be cut out of his, his lorry and ended up in hospital to, to cut a long story short. Um, and the interesting thing is it was on the 8th of the 8th, 1988, which is supposed to be one of the luckiest days ever. Um, and, and that really sparked my interest in healthcare and in nursing in particular, uh, going to visit him, um, seeing other people on the ward, other patients, um, and, you know, at times helping them as well. Um, especially the the older people who were, um, who, you know, who were living with dementia uh, and needed some extra support and just talking to uh, whilst on the ward, and, and seeing some of the great care that he received, but also some of the innovation. So at the time we lived in a, a terraced house and it was up some steps at the, the front of the house, and when he came home he had to come home in a wheelchair because he had pins in his legs and pins in his arms etc. External fixators, and um, it was the district nurse who just sort of looked around the house, looked in the garden and went, right, I'm going to talk to your neighbours. Off she went to talk to the neighbours and next minute um, my dad was being pushed up the neighbours drive around the back of their house. A fence panel was lifted up and it was pushed through the fence panel. Um, and it was just that creative thinking that made me think, oh, yeah, this this looks like a good career to be in where you can be innovative um, and, and thinking on your feet and every day being different. And that's what nursing is to me. Every day is different. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, the innovation back then when you experienced your father's accident. So maybe if you'd like to comment, what kind of difference between the innovation back then to what we currently face these days? Um, I, I think I think we need to be more and more creative and innovative these days in relation to the advances in digital technology uh, specifically. Um, and also watching um, artificial intelligence, the AI agenda moving um, and what opportunities that gives us across healthcare and across nursing, but also being aware that if we are dealing with people, so we also need to make sure that we've still got that person contact. Uh, And I think some of of the big innovations uh, around our profession as nurses and actually that move towards being acknowledged as a profession and the huge moves to graduate train profession in the UK, uh, especially in England, and also that safety critical profession um, where patient safety is is you know, one of the top areas of our agenda um, and the impact of a registered nurse with a degree of qualification on patient safety is there and the evidence is there and we need to reflect on that and we need to use that more um, for our voice to make sure that our patients, clients, service users get the care they need and deserve. Yeah and tell me you've had quite a bit of a transition throughout your career coming from clinical roles to more managerial and strategic positions so with that kind of transition, what kind of motivated you to make those shifts and specifically to, and I suppose this is something that you can answer as well, is there's a difference between what you're doing before, which was more hands-on, is it still the same approach now? Are you more hands-on or are you more strategic? Um, I think throughout my career, I've always wanted to make a difference. So no matter what role I've been in, I've always said I want to make a difference. and. 
whether that's in direct clinical care or indirect clinical care or in the roles of, of leadership and strategic roles that I'm in now, um, really wanting to make a difference. It is what drives me. Um, and, and people quite often say to me, do you miss you know, being with patients and being in clinical care? Well, I still do it. Um, it's still a priority of mine to be visible in those clinical areas. Um, and it's I still like to get out and about. I like to talk to you know, the, the staff, but I also like to actually sit and talk to um, our service users, our patients. I like to talk to their carers. Um, I, li I like to talk to people and being with people is what sort of drives me really. Um, and, and making sure that we still have that interaction and still have that professional curiosity to go and see what, mm -hmm. what's happening as well, as well as what uh, information is being shared with me or I'm being told. Um, so we can, can keep driving that improvement and driving that innovation in, in right at the heart of what we do and, and making the impact on on patients themselves who are receiving the care. Mm -hmm. And you've been with the NHS for quite a number of years. Um, tell me, what was the most sort of rewarding experiences coming out of the working in the NHS? Um, the NHS obviously has its challenges, like any other health system across across the globe. I would expect, um, but I, I think my, my values around being person centred about being there when when people need things are you know, the same values as the NHS uh, and you know we are very proud of the NHS in, across the UK um, and everything it does and everything it achieves um, no matter what we read in, in the press um, and still driving for that change. I think working in the NHS it is gives that sense of pride mm. um, and that, that sense of greater good for, for, to serve our you know, to serve our country. Um, we, are, we are public servants and um, that's what we, we sort of need to be doing really to drive that forward is working together more. Um, the NHS is stretched as we all know and there is a place for colleagues who work in the independent sector to support the, the NHS delivery as well um, but we just need to be careful around how we do that and um, what the impact is on um, a service that is free at the point of delivery and accessible to to all Hmm. So, maybe uh, you've published quite a number of works. Um, maybe if you could explain a bit about the concept behind Library of Lived Experiences for Mental Health that you helped design along with them, um, with your colleagues and other various participants. Sort of what makes this approach unique? Yeah, so, so the library of the experience was really exciting and it was a piece of uh, research that um, we did in partnership with Lancaster University and Professor Fiona Loban, um, who's a professor of psychology up there, and uh, Dr Paul Marshall, who, who works with, with Fiona in the psychology department. And the library of the experience it is, is, as I say, it is a library of people's stories. So in, instead of getting a book out, you will actually have a person who will come and tell their story. Um, and for me, the power of stories can't be underestimated. It really brings to life the, the, the service that we're driving, the impact that it has on people directly and indirectly, and actually brings some of the key performance indicators, some of the tools we use to drive change, brings it to life uh, and helps us really understand um, probably the emotional aspects of care as well, uh, as well, well as the sort of hard data driven care. And, and for me, with dealing with people, we need to look at hearts and minds. So our mind is driven by um, data and information, etc., which is really, really useful and we need that. But also we need to drive it with our hearts and that's where the stories come in and understanding, uh, as I say, the emotional aspects of care and the, the, the points within that care, which, mm -hmm. which have an emotional impact on people at different times, why that is um, and, and what we can change with that. And we can't do all that without hearing people's stories, um, whether that's a story in person, a digital story, um, and whether that's a, a negative or a positive story. Um, there's learning to learning in all those stories that we need to to utilise and drive forward um, to enhance care. Mm. And I'm sidebarring here for a moment. Does this approach only take a sort of patient centric approach, or are we also considering, you know, mental health? Um, when it comes to the nurses themselves? 
Uh, it can be anybody. So anyone can can share their story. Um, and uh, uh, I think you're right, Joshua, we need to look at the impact of, um, especially the last few years, on healthcare professionals as well, um, and look at how that has impacted people, that, how it's impacted their lives, but how it's impacted their professional career as well. Um, and those stories are really powerful as well to look at how work has an impact on mental health, physical health, and also, you know, on people's, um, what's the word I'm looking for, on people's energy um, mm. to, to work and to have, have a life as well. Mm. And another sidebar question, what currently is the NHS doing to sort of assist nurses with mental health um, and the phase of burnout and overworking. I know that this is something that I had a discussion with somebody in the US and there's various types of initiatives going on in order to provide resources, but in terms of your perspective, what's sort of going on in terms of that? Um, as an organization, there's lots going on and our health and well-being is a priority for our organization. Mm. Um, and that, that includes the, the run of the mill things such as occupational health, etc. But also having ad hoc health and well-being events so mm. people can explore what, what helps them. Um, some individuals have set up running clubs or you know people may be able to access yoga um, and different areas to, to help them themselves. Um, we also um, also look at staff development so how do we develop people again that helps people's health and well-being and their aspirations uh, and their drive to come to work the nhs as a whole and nhs england um r runs a sort of um what do i want to call it now a health and well-being hub um for healthcare professionals um that, that was very much in the press recently because there, there was talks of that stopping but that's been extended for a short while just to, to, to make sure that staff are supported. And that's a real welcome initiative because um, staff need that. And I think during the pandemic, that's one big thing we learned is that we don't support staff enough mm. um, and we don't show our care and compassion that we show to patients, to staff as much as we should. Uh, and that, that's pivotal in, in order to, not only to recruit, but also primarily to retain staff. Um, to keep the services going uh, and keeping care as good as it is and, and also you know enhancing that that quality of care. Mm. So touching back on the subject of your publications, um, you've recently contributed to a publication on how to be a successful nursing student. So what kind of key advice would you offer a nursing student today to excel in their studies and clinical practices? Um, I, I think it's absolutely paramount that no matter where we are in our careers, that, that we support nursing students and, and the next generation of nurses, um, A, to get the education, but to understand what a privilege it is to have that role and to be in people's lives at, at certain times um, and how they should use their academic studies to drive that change as well. Uh, and as I said earlier in, in one of the previous answers, that, that the importance of being safety critical um, and, and that's why registered nurses need to have that, that degree as well. Um, I, I, I've always been involved with student life, even from my days as a student, and also been involved as to support people, whether that's through mentorship, coaching, or, or writing different articles, and obviously more recently the publication you uh, you highlighted. Um, my advice to um, nursing students out there is um, try and get everything out of, of your studies that you can. Get involved in as much as you can so it's the wider nursing agenda not just the theory and the practice but also the politics of nursing um and also look at the widest thread of, of nursing so nursing isn't just about hospital care it's about community care it's about social care it's all about also about care within the voluntary sector hospices children's hospices etc um but also charities um, in the faith sector, and, and there's lots of sort of care social enterprises that are being developed really to drive innovative practice as well. And, and I suppose um, people who know me listen to this, um, it would be remiss of me to say that you know we work very hard, so mm. make sure you play even make sure you play even harder. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it seems very evident that you have quite a significant theme of leadership in your career and just your approach. So maybe discuss a little bit about the importance of leadership in nursing and how that can affect patient care. But most importantly, what 
need is there to enhance leadership skills in nurses today? I'm a firm believer that everyone in healthcare is a leader. We, we all are leading teams, we all are leading care. We're supporting the, the junior member staff who's working with us or a new start or whether that whether that's a new ward manager, um, a new catering assistant, a new domestic assistant, a new porter. We are all supporting those people um, no matter where we are and what our role is. So leadership is pivotal in, in driving things forward. And, and as nurses, we're leading care teams, but we're also leading care approaches. Um, and we're also leading a multi-professional team and coordinating all that care to meet an individual's needs um, and making sure that they're getting person-centred care and they're getting the care they deserve either to, to get to their place of residence or, you know, the care they need at the end of their life as well. Um, and, and, and that's for the wider um, patient's family as well uh, and their loved ones and friends, etc. So it's really a massive leadership role that we have. I think there's lots of opportunities uh, for nurses to develop their leadership, whether that's through a leadership academy or through their, their organisation's leadership development or role development courses that people should really grasp and, and take take hold of and really run with when they get opportunities. But also with external places like, you know, um, I, I dare say may allude to it uh, later, um, I've just been successfully in gaining a, a Florence Nightingale Foundation senior leadership scholarship which uh, which gives me you know opportunities to develop my leadership skills in ways that I haven't been have, haven't been open to me before working with the King's Fund working with the Royal, Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts and looking at how I um, present myself and communication um, and how important that is to us as leaders uh, as well as developing myself through coaching uh, and develop myself through reflection as well. So th there's lots of opportunities for people to, to to develop their leadership skills and lots of opportunities for people to to use those leadership skills across the whole healthcare and nursing spectrum, uh, no matter what field of nursing you, you, you work in. Absolutely. You mentioned the Florence Nightingale Foundation. Can you maybe share a bit more about this, in, this foundation, the work of it and your role within it? Yeah, um, the Florence Nightingale Foundation is a, is a charity um, and um, it, it's been set up for over 100 years now. Um, and, and, and it's there really to support people's development. So they do scholarships for um, internationally educated nurses. They do early career scholarships. Um, and, and right up to the one I'm doing around senior leadership. Um, and having those programmes in place it, it is key to help that development and, you know, supporting organisations like Florence Nightingale Foundation um, really does drive a change and make a difference with it within nursing. Um, it, it's obviously based in the UK and it helps helps people to develop their experiences, but also to connect with other people as well. Uh, and, and then that comes back to, you know, supporting leadership and sort of that influential um, healthcare that, that we're sort of moving to. Um, but driving that that change in clinical outcomes and patient experiences and using the, the leadership capacity, but also developing our capability in that as well. Mm. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, in the world we're in at the minute, making sure that our professional voice is heard effectively um, and using opportunities where our voice can be heard to drive change, to break down health inequalities, to 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 make sure that everyone across you know, our society and across our communities matters. Mm. Um, and you know, the, the Florence Nightingale Foundation is a, a great place um, to have that, that development. Um, and obviously it, it's founded following Florence Nightingale, who you know, is probably one of the world's most famous nurses. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the impact that, sh that she made on nursing w with others, you know, so there's not, there isn't just Florence Nightingale, there are others. Um, but what she did as well, um, really sort of drove nursing practice and nursing care forward um, to, to where we are now, really. Yeah. So given your extensive experience in project management, um, you know, pivoting away from this topic, and policy development, what do you see as the next big step in healthcare improvement? 
I think the biggest step we need to take and the biggest challenge we need to face head on is health inequalities. Mm. Um, and again, you know, probably from legacy from the pandemic, but that really showed those health inequalities, the, the, those those people from black and minority groups, how um, disempowered they are, disenfranchised they are. Um, when it comes to healthcare, people from different genders, um, people from different sexual orientations or, and people with disabilities, really we really need to sort of break down those barriers and make sure that healthcare is um equitable for all and there's parity across the whole system so you know mental health learning disabilities children or adult nursing you know needs to have the same uh, priorities but also we need to look at what what is preventing people from accessing that health care that we need to make sure that that everyone has that access to um to drive for a healthier nation and for a global health as well um, in some of that work is, is fundamental and, and and that's where I see organisations like the World Health Organisation or International Council of Nurses really driving and influencing that change uh, and again going back to what I said earlier in relation to the Florence Nightingale Foundation making sure our voice is heard mm. um, we need to make sure our voice is heard at that, that clinical level but we need to make sure our voice is heard at a global level as well um, and, and, and that's going to drive change, not only for local, us locally, but also across many countries who, who you know, have faced lots of challenges in relation to um, health, finance, um, nutrition, and, and you know, and especially what's happening in the world in relation to, to war, um, and, and making sure that the people are supported and, and that nurses and healthcare professionals are advocating for those people who are in the middle of that. Yeah. All right, Paul, just to draw to a conclusion, sort of looking ahead, what are some of the innovative projects or initiatives you're excited about in the healthcare sector or something that you're currently working on or developing? Um, I, I think what is exciting is how we are more and more using stories mm. um, and using um, and, and breaking down the process of the obsession with process and pathway, which we need, but also actually have having people as the priority. Um, so how does that process and pathway impact people? How can people make a difference uh, to their own healthcare along their process and pathway? Um, and, and I think that that's one of the most exciting bits that we need to be thinking about and really driving and making a difference with person centred care, um, not only for those that we look after, but also for each other. Um, and on and, and a project I'm involved in at the minute relating to one of our um, new hospital sites, it's called Worley, um, and it, it's the innovation that's going to go into there in relation to the arts, in relation to how therapy interacts with uh, with people and, and actually that therapeutic intervention, um, how that how that makes a difference. And the site at Worley is huge, so it, it's also how nature and art come together to make a difference to, to people um, and understanding how the great outdoors can really benefit people's health and well-being and then they can utilize that in their therapeutic intervention whether that's through the arts or whether that is through other ways that, that they feel is going to benefit them. Amazing well Paul I think you have pretty much given quite a bit of information and very insightful and very intuitive. So yeah, thank you so much yeah, for joining you. this channel. Um, for the listeners out there, you can always um, read up on Paul and some of his projects and publications. Very good stuff. And thank you so much for tuning in. And we'll catch you next time for another episode. Bye. Thanks, everybody.